Welcome to Christ Life Today, where we explore the glorious realities of life in Jesus Christ. Tonight we are continuing our Bible study in 1 Peter chapter 3. Last week we started chapter 3 and we did one verse. All right, so uh, we will... Um, Let's, uh, I'll reread chapter 3, 1, and then 2 uh, kind of ends the first little section. And then as I read these two verses, you might come to understand why we just did one verse last week. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So 1 Peter 3. She talks a lot. Uh-huh. She's the wife. Uh, yeah, uh huh. Yeah, but my wife just said because she was here and she talks a lot and she's the wife. She's the wife. So now well, let's see what Peter says and why we're talking about wives. <laughs> Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won uh, by the conversation or the behavior of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation or behavior coupled with fear. So that's the first two verses. <clears throat> and we spent all of last Bible study studying verse 1. Uh, wives be in subjection to your own husbands. And there was a lot involved with that. Um, we looked back into chapter 2, which started about halfway through the chapter a little uh about being in submission to governing authorities. And then the next section of the chapter, servants being subject to your masters. And then chapter three, wives be subject to your husbands. So there's a, a common theme going on here. And um, we concluded that the approach in each case was similar. Uh, <clears throat> and basically our conclusion was um, and we looked, we concluded that based on all three of them, but the idea is, okay, well, when, if ever, should I rebel? And I think we concluded last week that, um, would there be a possible, would there be a time where a wife should rebel against her husband? And my answer was yes, but you're likely not to find it. Be, because that's really the conclusion with the um, governing authorities. Uh, it says it says in that section, obey the emperor as supreme. I mean, it, it doesn't just say obey the emperor. It says obey the emperor as supreme. So uh, so we're not going to rehash everything. But the bottom line for all of, for all of these different submissions so far that we talked about was as believers. We should be diligently looking for ways to obey rather than diligently looking for loopholes to disobey. And most often, we are very quick to give an excuse for bad behavior. We're very fast to give an excuse for disobedience. Uh, we're quick to justify ourselves. Um, <clears throat> and so... We talked about Daniel and Joseph and for some examples, and in their cases, you know, in Daniel's case, as far as we know, he disobeyed the king one time. No other time is recorded in the Bible that I know of. And that makes perfect sense to me because if I'm the king, I'm not going to elevate someone to second in charge who is uh, constantly disobeying, constantly rebelling, constantly bad-mouthing behind my back. Mm -hmm. So, God's Word commands it, and but we did, we did say there are. So, out of, all, out of all that I can think of, we came up with three examples from the previous uh, things. Um, Daniel, when he was told not to pray to God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were told to worship an idol. And Peter and John when they were told not to preach in Jesus' name. None of their rebellion was self-serving. 
it was all in, yeah, you tell me not to obey something specifically addressing God and my relationship to him. <clears throat> um, so the conclusion there is, you know, probably almost never do we find ourselves in a position where disobedience and rebellion is justified. And if we do, we have to seriously weigh the consequences, don't lawyer up, don't figure out how you're going to get away with it. Mm. No, Lord, I just have to. You tell me not to preach in Jesus' name, guess who's preaching? Uh, now, if you tell me not to preach in Jesus' name 12 feet from the door, guess who's going to step back a foot and preach from 13 feet? Right. Okay, so I'm not going to die on that hill. But if you tell me not to preach in Jesus' name, like they told the apostles, I'm, I'm hopefully, hopefully, I say this in faith, hopefully I'm going to do what Peter and John did and said, and right to your face, judge for yourself, whether it's right for me to obey you or God. God commands me to preach Jesus to all the world. Guess who's not going to listen to you? <clears throat> so they, 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 didn't, they didn't cower back. They didn't. Hi, they didn't say, oh, oh, well, we'll consider that, you know. No, right in their face. They didn't change their behavior. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood out, stuck out like thor sore thumbs because everybody else was on their face in front of that idol. They were the only ones upright. Wow. Okay, so imagine. I mean, you got the king of the known world, basically, commanding obedience and everybody's on their face before their idol and these three guys are standing. Nope, not doing it. Not doing it. And Daniel, he went to the same window he always went to, which the guys knew where he prayed and they were able to easily catch him because they knew he was going to do what he had to do. So again, rebellion is not a good thing. Except if they tell you not to uh, maintain your relationship with God. Okay, so we need to look for places to obey and it, uh, it, it goes with uh, governing authorities, it goes with servants and masters, and dare I say, yes I do because God said it, it goes with wives and husbands, all right? <clears throat> you know, I'm not, not throwing myself under the bus, I didn't write it. Uh, I just believe it, you know. So, so we're going on with that. So we did a lot with verse one. Um, just real quick, um, at that time, Peter specifically, and more than once in this chapter, says, "Submit to your own husbands." And we talked about that um, uh, with regards to at that time, it was un almost unthinkable for a wife to not be of the same religion as the husband. So if the wife gets saved, you know, that was, that was unthinkable. The other thing that came out, which I had never even thought of, but came out last week was, um, if the wife gets saved and the husband's not, they were asking questions like, should I leave that jerk? You know, he's not a Christian. He doesn't follow Jesus. Should I leave him? Um, uh, and then also it was brought up through one of the commentators I read where the on-fire newly believing wife could be attracted to an on-fire believing man who's not her husband. Not even necessarily sexually, but just like covering wise. And that's not appropriate either. So Peter specifically says, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Uh, that kind of thing. And so we talked at length a little bit about, well, at length about that last time. So now we're moving on to um, verse 2. Uh, <clears throat> while, while they behold your chaste behavior coupled with fear. So back to verse 1, uh, that the wives, by their behavior, the wives might win their husbands without a word. 
by their behavior. And we talked about the adornment, and it says not you know not adorning yourselves with you know gold and plating the hair and everything like that. And we talked that it's not bad to take care of your physical appearance, but that's not what's what's going to ultimately be attractive to your husband. Uh, it's there's something spiritual going on. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Definitely something spiritual and, going on. And it's going <clears throat> towards the husband. And it's going towards the wife in many different ways. Yeah. And so it's best that she is, <clears throat> is quiet about what's going on with her. Mm -hmm. And well he if he's not being spiritual, he's not gonna have a clue anyways. But but if he is spiritual, well, God's doing the work in him. And um, this kind of stuff, it's kind of like the Lord says, leave this for me. Leave, leave this, this awkward stuff because I'm doing something that you're not expecting. Yeah. And, yeah. and it may be that it comes to fruition someday, and that's wonderful, glorifies God. But even if it's extreme and it doesn't really come through, well, God says, that one marriage um, seminar that we Love went and to, respect. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's three options or three categories. Something <coughs> about the wife, something about the husband, and then ka -ching. That's about, this isn't working, this isn't working. But in the, in the Lord... There is a reward for even if it never works out. God's in, you know, God's yeah. doing things. And so the bottom line with all that is each person in the marriage has to focus on the only one they can affect, and that's themselves. You know, and most often uh, people desperately want to fix the other person. Mm. You know, I mean, we're real. But we're real. Sometimes they think. Supposed to, yeah, but no, mm. it, it's going to keep having the same result. Yeah, mm. no, and and just, they, they and the bottom them. line is, God's the only one who's going to fix the other person, and He's the only one that's going to fix me too. Yeah. But I'm the I'm the only one who can take part in Him fixing mm. me. I can't really take part in Him fixing my wife, except to behave the way He tells me to do. And again, that's back on me, you know, it's like I can't, and that's what Peter's saying right here, by her, by the wife's chaste uh, behavior, she can win the husband without a word. And this is, I think, the all, it's interesting, this is the only place that I can think of in the Bible where a person could be won without a word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Every time the gospel goes forth, it's always preached in the Bible. It's always spoken, uh, <clears throat> you know, so. But here, because this relationship is so different than all others, it's yeah. two become one. And hopefully they're living together, you know, nowadays, you know. You know, it's too easy to just go your own way. But um, they're living together. They're seeing each other's lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly, or maybe if we put it in priority, the ugly, the bad, and the good, because that's probably the more more realistic uh, reality. But they're seeing each other. So if the unbelieving husband is seeing not perfect but godly behavior of his wife towards him, no matter what kind of an idiot he is, he's seeing it. And God can work through that. Yeah. Um, if he's an idiot and she's an idiot, well, you got two idiots banging heads together and God's just going, <laughs> will you people let me in? Yeah. You know, so so the, the chaste, uh, chaste and respectful in verse 2. Behold, while they behold your chaste, in some translations say respectful, uh, conversation or behavior, which would, conversations, old King James, 
uh, behavior. So chaste or respectful. <clears throat> Basically, the definition is properly clean, figuratively innocent, modest, perfect. So perfection's where we're going, where we're heading for. Um, but even, but even, but even in our imperfection, if we're godly and we're doing it God's way, we can make the imperfection perfect. So if we fly off the handle at each other and whichever one's more godly uh, goes and apologizes and honestly, you know, not I apologize that you were such a jerk, uh, you know, and made me mad. Yeah. I, that that's not going to fly. Gotta do it the right way. Yeah, that's not going to fly. But if you, <clears throat> in sincerity, uh, make it right in a godly way, now you've just disarmed the so-called enemy. I mean, you know. Uh, well, yeah, what? You're telling me you're a Christian and you acted like that yesterday? I mean, what, what, if, that's what, if that's what following Jesus does, yeah. you know, I don't want no part of that. Well, a sincere, honest, make things right, you no longer have that weapon. You know, and that goes in kind of all aspects of life. The, the one story that I know a friend of mine got saved decades ago and went to work and he was sharing Jesus with people and then one day he went off the handle and did something stupid I don't even know what it was and uh, <clears throat> but it was clearly stupid and um, and then uh, like I don't know if it was the next day or whatever but very soon afterwards he went in and used that opportunity to preach to the guys Look, guys, I know I've become a Christian and I've been telling you guys about it. And the other day, I messed up big time. Now, I've asked God to forgive me. And because Jesus died for my sins, he has. Now I'm asking you to forgive me. Well, where's their weapon against him anymore? It's gone. He admitted guilt. He's not defending himself. He admitted guilt and asked for forgiveness. What are they going to say? You're a jerk. Well, actually, you did the you did the right thing and admitted you're wrong. You know, so I mean, you disarm you disarm people that way. So this chaste or respectful behavior, properly clean, innocent, modest, perfect. Um, I note a submiss a submissive and respectful wife is more powerful at winning an unbelieving husband than a disrespectful and rebellious wife. A godly woman is very attractive to her husband. So that was my note. Well, let's see what the commentator said. Um, one of them said, the benefit of submission is shown in the way that it affects husbands for God. A wife's submission is a powerful expression of her trust in God. This kind of faith and obedience can accomplish great things even without a word. So, oh, pretty good stuff. The place of a wife is, it's on a different level, like you said, in other relationships. And, and, um, and God's favor is really on that. And he is going to really focus on her trust in him. Yeah. Because um, he's going to really mess with her through her husband using him. So that she, because every woman, at least so they say, <coughs> a woman, she has insecurities. And uh, even if she's kind of a dominant kind of person, um, and so, when, you, when you're, you know, love casts out fear, there's a verse in the Bible yeah. like that, and God, he really wants people to know how much his love is there for them, mm -hmm. 
And that they don't have to fear it with him around. Yeah. I said, he's going to... Repeatedly throughout this chapter, <clears throat> throughout the book, but repeatedly, Peter keeps coming back and back and back to ultimately trusting God. Mm-hmm. Has nothing to do with trusting your husband because... Mm-hmm then it would be totally justified to be disrespectful and, mm-hmm. you know, if, if it was based on the husband. It, that would also be very unfair to us husbands because no one can can be- carry that load. Right. You know, only God could carry that load. But and every couple, when they get married, they have no idea of how that there is so much reason for it not to work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. so much, like, even even expectations, realistically. Yeah. No. But God, he's, <clears throat> he does that all the time. That's he why we need that three-stranded cord. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Even in that, it does say on mine, second verse, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I think I've got yeah, that in here. Did I look that up? Hold on. I'm thinking of accompany and fear. Wow. Company of little respect. Yeah, I think that I, I don't have that in my notes. Maybe it maybe it's in the next uh, commentator. I thought I looked that up, but yeah. Uh, so yeah. respect comes. Well, in this case, it should come because God commands it, uh, but it's also. <clears throat> there's an element of fear in respect, you know, because you you don't respect someone or something that can't do anything, you know. I mean, generally speaking, other other than a respect for humanity, I mean, you you know, you go by a homeless druggie, you're not respecting the lifestyle, you're not respecting the choices, you're not respecting. I wouldn't disrespect the humanity. Right. Uh, that's a person Jesus died for. Yeah. Um, but you're not, you know, you're not welling with notions. I'm going to submit to this guy. You know, right. uh, he he submits to the drug. You know, so I mean, so it's bottom line is all about trusting Jesus. Mm-hmm. That over and over again. The other thing to keep in mind as we go through this. Husbands and wives, like Pastor often says, who's the bride of Christ? Yeah. That includes me. Yeah. You know, Jesus is the husband. You're the bride. We're a part of the bride. <laughs> so it has applications for men too, in that sense, in a spiritual reality of being the bride of Christ. And of course, nobody argues that the believer should submit to the husband, Jesus, in everything. No believer would be stupid enough to state that argument. Many of us are stupid enough to make those kind of arguments from tertiary uh, points, you know. Well, Jesus, I don't know. Do you really understand? Like Peter, rise, kill, and eat. No way, Lord, I'm not doing that. Well, wait a second. How do you say no way and Lord in the same sentence? I mean, so this is a picture, an imperfect picture, but it's a picture of the body of Christ relating to Jesus, husbands and wives. No wonder the church is in such dysfunction and disarray because the, Satan has attacked the family and uh, done everything he can to destroy the picture that God uses in his Bible of Christ in the church, husband and wife. Well, you know, so it's no wonder Satan's attacking the family because that's the, that's the way to attack solid relationships in the body of Christ. No, I, I personally think that other than perfect love, which only comes from God, right? But that perfect love <clears throat> casts out all fear. Mm-hmm. If we can know that we can know that we can know that God has only love and goodwill towards us. He's, there's nothing that would make us feel like he's going to, you know, 
talk to us or yeah. hurt us yeah. or, or deceive us. Now, depending on how good the relationship is with husband and wife, there'll be different degrees of more fear or less fear. And so we want we want to convey, you know, genuine love <coughs> because otherwise your spouse is gonna experience fear. And God doesn't want that. Mm, okay. Yeah. Well, so my point is that's why I think that word in fear means in respect, like being respectful. Yeah, I don't have it in my notes here yet. Uh, I thought I looked it up, but maybe it's maybe it's further ahead in, in another verse or something. I was pretty sure I looked that up. So, all right. So reverence is the word. Reverence. Okay. Yeah, I mean, fear fear often has the reverence connotation too. So, so just respecting the place of authority, just accepting it. Yeah. Realizing, okay, this is what, this is how this relationship. This is how happen. this is what God ordained. Yeah. I mean, mm. it, that's the bottom line, over and over again. Trust God. Trust God. Uh, don't trust Him to do what you want Him to do. Mm-hmm. Trust Him to do what He knows He needs to do. So, all right. Another commentator on this verse says. The, I like this one. The attractiveness of a wife's submissive behavior, even to an unbelieving husband, suggests that God has inscribed the rightness and beauty of role distinctions to include male leadership or headship in the family and female acceptance and responsiveness to that leadership. The unbelieving husband sees this behavior and deep within perceives the beauty of it. Within his heart, there is a witness that this is right. This is how God intended men and women to relate as husband and wife. He concludes, therefore, that the gospel which his wife believes must be true as well. It's amazing how God uses this. Yep. Yep. Yeah, still gets me. This was the point where I was going to tell that story that I told last week, but uh, there's my note right there. (laughs) So, yeah, so if you didn't catch the story last week that I told, um, go back to the YouTube channel and uh, check it out, um, Christ Life, uh, probably ChristLife.online and look at our Christ Life TV which takes you to the YouTube channel. It's a lot easier that way than finding it. And that's uh, on, Peter, first Peter. Yeah, first there's, a play, there's a playlist for each of the Bible studies that we've done so far. Uh, but yeah, go last week because it, it's a powerful, powerful story uh, that goes right along here with what Peter uh, tells us, which should not be surprising to us because the Holy Ghost wrote it. So, uh, you know... We, can't, we shouldn't be surprised that it's true. All right, so moving on to verses 3 and 4 is the next section, which um, <clears throat> I have entitled uh, True Beauty, Outward Versus Inward Adornments. Somebody want to read those two verses? Your beauty should not come from outward adornments, such as braided hair or the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. All right. So the focus is the inward person. Um, You know, a lot of times I I like to think if we, maybe especially women, put as much time and effort into our spiritual health and well-being as we do our physical health and well-being or appearance. In this case, it's talking specifically about the appearance. Uh, You know, we'd have the body of Christ full of superheroes. I mean, you know, uh, you think about it. I mean, what what we've got to focus on is you know, um, 
physical, mental, and spiritual. Well, <clears throat> when you go through the grocery stores, you never see anything, you know, on the, in the checkout aisles about true spiritual growth. You might see some whacked out crazy stuff in those aisles, but you know, you're not going to you're not going to find Bibles in the checkout aisle at the grocery store. It's just not happening. Uh, you might find some nut job meditating himself to Pluto and to determine if it's actually a planet anymore or not. I don't know. But, you know, you might see something like that in the checkout aisles, but true spirituality is not there. But what you will find in the checkout aisles is all kinds of magazines and star articles about physical well-being mm -hmm. and physical appearance. And then if you go to college and finish, find out how long you're paying that college bill and see how much emphasis there is on the mental aspects. But a pastor trying to get a living wage and everyone's calling him a charlatan and a money grubber. I mean, the guy might be making 30000 a year and he's a charlatan and a money grubber, but you paid that much for one course in, in college. I mean, I'm not going to apologize, people. To me, the person or people who are instrumental in leading me to the Lord are, is far more valuable than a neurosurgeon. And I'm not downing neurosurgeons. I like Ben Carson. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm not downing people who, I'm not downing education. I'm not downing, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, earning an appropriate living. You know, I'm not downing that. But I am saying that the attitude that says a pastor making a living wage is a charlatan and a shyster, I despise that attitude. Because in the New Testament and the Old Testament, God speaks about providing for his ministers. Uh, First or second Corinthians, I forget which one, nine fourteen, for they that preach the gospel ought to make their living from the gospel. You got a problem with that? Take it up with the author. I didn't write it, I just quote it and I believe it. And I'm not asking for any money. All right. In all the years I've been doing this, I've never once asked anybody for any money. I have received it on occasion when people have offered, but I don't ask. So it's, you got two sides of that coin there. On the one side, you got a lousy attitude that says, just give me, just give me. On the other side, you can have a lousy attitude that says, just pay me. Both are wrong, okay? Now, how we got on that from wives submitting to your husbands, I have no idea. I have no idea, but God knows. All right, so how did that happen? <laughs> Oh, the great price. Okay. There we go. There we go. I knew there had to be something that triggered it. Um, yeah. Like a woman, she um, <clears throat> needs to focus on the inner. Like, you know how Jesus said, focus back in the eye and the log in the eye. Even if she is made only has a speck in the eye. You know when you get a piece of dust in your eye, you're hopping all over the <laughs> universe. You can't see out of it. You're mm -hmm. and you're you're trying everything to get relieved of that pain. <clears throat> and um, but but Jesus says you focus on what the what problem you have. If you've got a big log, well yeah, you definitely need help. Yeah. But even if you get the speck in your eye, you focus on that. And I don't do. <laughs> I take care of the other stuff. You be and if you eat, and some, sometimes you can't really do anything. And that's often where the Lord takes you. That you can't do anything. But just um, delight yourself in the Lord. Just um, focusing on Him. Just just pleasing Him. <clears throat> like if at the moment you know your husband doesn't feel like a husband to you, you do have a husband. God is your husband. But God, He's going to work things out. And, but don't but if you're focusing on, okay, I've only got a speck, he's got a log, mm -hmm. that's the problem. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the problem, <coughs> your speck. Mm 
<laughs> the spec you have is the wrong focus. You just focus recognizing I'm doing something and, and this is the stuff inside of you that I want to work on. So just don't be focused on him because nothing's going to happen then. Because why would God take the, like fi fix the law when he's using the law to expose in your heart, mm. in my, my heart, the speck? Mm -hmm. God does it that way. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yeah, so this is this verse, focus on, talking about focus, focus on spiritual beauty over physical beauty. <clears throat> Your husband will be far more attracted to you if you are spiritually beautiful. External beauty is fading and will not sustain love and the marriage relationship. Adherence to the word of God is powerful. That's what notes that I came out of this with. Uh, our emphasis, oh gee, I jumped ahead of myself again. Our emphasis is so wrong. Look at how much time and money is spent on physical beauty, clothing, hair care, makeup, manicures, and pedicures. Compared, well, if you don't have money. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but the, the love of money, so if you would love to have all these things, is still a problem, even if you can't have them. Yeah, so... And then compared to how little time is spent on spiritual beauty, Bible study, prayer, church fellowship, evangelism. And, you know, again, you can see that. Just uh, compare, you know, Sunday or Bible study attendance with, um, yeah. you know, the... Uh, the Bills game. Well, the Bills game, yeah. There you go, physical or whatever, some entertainment, you know. Uh, <clears throat> And, and they pay big bucks to go do that, you know. Uh, yeah, so so both are both are okay, but proper priorities are critical. Or in the case of First Peter three, we have already seen in verses one and two, respectful submission and fidelity to of the wife to the wife's own husband and godly behavior. Now we see in verse three, the proper focus is on. Uh, the spiritual and not as much on the physical. So the first couple of verses have been focused on respect and submission for the husband. Now the focus is on the internal beauty, the spiritual beauty, which will go hand in hand with the first two verses. Uh, you know, uh, it all goes together. Having the right focus on yourself also helps with the first couple of verses that that godliness that's talked about that godly submission and and things like that it goes hand in hand with with the um, focus on spiritual beauty so all right so one of the commentators says <clears throat> peter did not forbid all adornment but for the godly woman, outward adornment is always in moderation, and her emphasis is always on inward adornment. And then, um, let's see my note here. Okay, I had notes. Interesting, I did not know this. This was something I came up to, and I wanted to glance ahead to see what it was I didn't know when I wrote the note. Uh, another commentator <clears throat> In the world Peter lived, in the world Peter lived, women often arranged and dyed their hair. They also wore wigs, especially blonde wigs made from hair imported from Germany. Peter had this in mind, speaking of the adornment that is merely outward. Peter did not forbid a woman fixing her hair or wearing jewelry any more than he forbade her from wearing uh, apparel. You know, so the word fine apparel is not in the original that was added. Uh, yeah. So so basically, he didn't forbid wearing clothes. He's not forbidding combing your hair, taking care of yourself that way. Mm -hmm. But he is saying, you know, let's keep the emphasis right. Um, and it all goes hand in hand with proper response to the husband and and godliness. I mean, really, if if you are if you are um, 
adorning yourself spiritually, the world is probably not going to take a lot of notice of it. But your husband is. And probably others in the body of Christ will see it as well. But if you're adorning yourself physically, the husband might have some reason to be jealous. Because if you're adorning yourself physically, lots of people might take notice. Not just your husband. So, you know, again, it's, it's not intentionally look frumpy and, you know, that's not what he's saying. But if the outward emphasis far outweighs the in, inward emphasis, it's really going to amount to little or nothing. You know, it's, it's not going to impact the husband. The, it's not, definitely not going to impact the unbelieving husband because sooner or later you're going to get older and it's going to be harder to maintain the outward, you know. Uh, but as you grow spiritually, you just get more and more and more beautiful. You never get, it never goes the other way. Um, now in eternity, we won't have to worry about any of that. Uh, praise the Lord. All right, so another note on verse 3. Um, compare, uh, compare verse 3 with 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, which says, In like manner also uh, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braid, braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becomes, becometh women professing godliness with good works. Uh, so the internal spiritual is going to show itself outwardly with good works. Um, shamefacedness, I looked that word up, that's an old English word, basically bashfulness, modesty. Um, pleasing God should be the wife's focus, as my notes. Pleasing God should be the wife's focus. God will intervene on your on your behalf if you are living to trust and please Him. So, again, uh, Peter and Paul saying the same thing. Um, nothing jumps to mind. I didn't notice, but probably James or some, you know, maybe some of the others touch on this as well. I don't know. Uh, but Peter and Paul, the two biggies from the New Testament, you know, they're both saying the same thing. You know, focus on what's important. Man, we so often focus on things that are next to meaningless. You know, I don't want to say they're meaningless, but often next... If they're not meaningless, they're close, you know. Uh, so, um, and well, I guess I'm kind of maybe jumping ahead a little bit too. So, uh, verse 4. All right. <clears throat> so, don't, don't dress yourself with bra braided hair, uh, wearing gold or fancy clothes, but... Do dress yourself. Let it be the hidden person of the heart in, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God great price. All right. So, looked up imperishable. Uh, so, imperishable beauty, not corruptible. Uh, definition is undecaying, which we just talked about, in, in essence of continuance. So with that, we just talked about that, is focusing on the internal spiritual beauty never goes backwards. It never decays. It never gets old. It just gets better, you know. Uh, it gets better with age, and we got all eternity. So that's an awesome thought. Um, so we need to focus on the that which is imperishable, incorruptible, uh, never fades away. And then um, the hidden man of the heart, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, meek and gentle. Um, so meek, uh, meek or gentle, some translations say gentle, uh, by definition is mild, 
or by implication, humble. So, humble, again, thinking in terms of, you know, trying to relate it, kind of, I think makes it easier to maybe grasp. <clears throat> We're the bride of Christ. He's the husband, the bridegroom. We're the bride. In light of who he is, it shouldn't be difficult to be humble. I mean, he's he's God, you know. Uh, so, and then the picture of that relationship is the husband and wife. If the wife goes back to verse one and respects her husband properly, the way that God's word is calling for, humility is not difficult. Humility is difficult when. It's, and there's another verse which I just comes to mind. Um, esteeming others as better than yourself. Well, yeah, that pretty much husband wife can practice that every day. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and but the, the the thing about that 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 society makes that difficult is because you know there's all all the teaching of self-value and self-worth and everything and it, it really it does it, it muddles things up so the teaching generally goes something like this you know i'm so valuable i was worth christ's death on the cross i mean god loved me so much that he he saw fit to send jesus no jesus died for me not because i was worth it mm -hmm. because he's love if he died because of my value, he never would have come. <laughs> I'll just speak for myself. He, won't, he wouldn't have come for me if it was based on my value. Yeah. Well, when, if you think about it, think about it logically. If we're supposed to esteem others as better than ourselves, if we were worth Christ's death on the cross and we had this great self-value and self-worth, the very best I could do is esteem others as equal to myself because I'm worth Jesus' death on the cross and you're worth Jesus' death on the cross. I can't look at myself as, oh, wretched man that I am, you know, because, well, wait a second, I, I was worth Jesus, you know. I mean, I was worth the blood of Christ. I mean, you, you don't get no better than that. You know, so logically speaking, the best we could do is esteem others as equal to ourselves. But that's not what the Bible says. And that's what not what walking in humbleness and humility is all about. Walking in humility is Jesus saying in John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. How much more humbling does it get than that? Without Jesus, everything, without Jesus, 100% of everything I ever do is a flop. Everything, no matter how good it looks to everybody else, everything I do without Jesus is garbage. It's trash. It's filthy rags. I won't even get into what that means. <clears throat> go, I, yeah, most people do, but go look it up if you want to. That, that one's for another day. But, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it's I, how much more humbling can it be? Without me, you can do nothing. Now, also on the flip side, how much more humbling can it be? In Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So me, I can do nothing. Christ in me can do everything. Anything and everything he wants and expects to do, he can do. So two sides of the same coin. What Bob does is utter and complete and total garbage. What Christ in Bob does is utter and complete total awesomeness, glorifies God 100% of the time, every time, 1,000%, infinite percent. Okay? If we get the Word of God into us, it's a whole lot easier. I won't say easy, but it's a whole lot easier to walk in the light of what God says if we just believe it. Uh, and that's the next thing. We have to purpose in our heart that no matter what this word says, no matter how much I hate what it says sometimes, I still believe it, I love it, and I embrace it even though I hate it. 
sometimes it's a love-hate relationship, <laughs> you know. Uh, I hate it that uh, God says that uh, the way is broad that leads to destruction and most people are going to find it. Mm -hmm. I hate that. I'd rather cherry pick and hand pick a few people that deserve to go there. You know, I'd have Hitler there and, uh, you know, uh, maybe the Ayatollah and a few other people. You know, I'd cherry pick, but, you know, the, the, you know, the others, you know, I'd make the path broad. God didn't ask my opinion, so uh, we're good with it. So I, I hate it the most are going to the wrong place, going to destruction. That's why I'm motivated to tell people the way to the narrow gate. Mm. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. That's three, that's three verses before the love of Christ constrains me to preach the gospel. Most people don't know that. Wow. It's either 1st or 2nd Corinthians 5, verses 11 and 14. I forget which one. It's either 1st or 2nd. Um, but yeah, so there's things that... that, that we need to be motivated. We, we need to embrace what the Word of God says, no matter what. And sadly, today, so many people want to perform mental gymnastics to make the Bible say what they think it ought yeah. to say, yeah. or what they think it actually says, but it doesn't say. Uh, <clears throat> the... If, if they could do that, if they could do that acrobatically, they'd be stars in a circus. You know, the mental gymnastics is unbelievable. The Bible actually says A, B, C, and they perform twists and contortions and jump through hoops to make it say X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I have a flood of examples that I'm not going to get into because uh, that's another bunny trail for another day. Uh, so... And then quiet, uh, meek and gentle, uh, which is mild or humble, and quiet uh, spirit, was quiet is strong, keeping one's seat, still undisturbed, undisturbing, peaceable. So basically, quiet is just keep wow, your place. Wow, that's like something. Undisturbed. Undisturbed and undisturbing. It's like, how many women are undisturbed? Like, I, 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 at least for myself. It doesn't take much for me to feel disturbed about something. No, I keep, I, I keep my, I keep quiet about it. But inside, I'm mm -hmm. disturbed. I gotta do something about this. I certainly have to pray, 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 and all this yeah. kind of stuff. But the Lord says, no, don't be like that. Oh, don't be disturbed by this extreme and that extreme. Yeah. God says, quiet down. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you, like when you do that, it's like, a, and like some of these extremes are like, okay, now I have to do something about you that. You hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's like even, like even other people would say, yes, that is a thing that you have to address. Yeah. But the Lord says, I want you to stay undisturbed. Yeah. I want you to trust me. Yeah. And yeah. Just let me yeah. accomplish all that I have in mind with your situation or whatever. But like, I'm not trying to blame women, I'll just blame myself. But I kind of think that in general, it's very easy for women to be disturbed. And that is not what I want because I recognize <coughs> yeah. it doesn't do any good. No. It just mucks things up even yeah. more. Yeah, and that, that goes back to that trusting God. And this goes back to the beauty that they're taught. Don't worry too much about the hair. Do, you know, do what you got to do. But don't worry too much about the hair and the makeup and the, the gold and the jewelry and the clothes. Uh, worry more, not worry, focus more on the spiritual life. And so... Uh, one of the commentators, this means that it does not, the, so this internal beauty, this means that it does not decay or get worse with age, which has been said repeatedly already. Instead, incorruptible beauty only gets better with age. I wonder where I got that from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and therefore, and is, a, and is therefore of much greater value than the beauty that comes from hair, jewelry, or clothing. Um, 
which is what it says here, which is in the sight of God, great price. So spiritual adornment in God's sight is of great value. I can't even comprehend how God values something. I mean... Well, I think it's because when we do things God's way, He says... Now that's something yeah. worth looking at. Yeah. And, and I just aware, got it. But that's the news of the day. I just, okay. I just got it. The way God values something is it's not I but Christ in me. Mm. Oh. There's the value. Whenever I do something right that glorifies God, it's not I but Christ. Oh, yeah. There's the value. Whoa, that's cool. Yeah. That is cool, man. God values inward spiritual beauty because it's Christ doing it. Yeah, that's cool. Mm. He must really, really love seeing his son accomplish something in us. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Be, us being undisturbed yeah. through Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really must. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's his, that's his plan. I mean, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, most people don't often don't read 10, uh, but 8, 9, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ unto, ordained unto good works. So when we're born again, God has plans for us. And certainly he loves it when he sees his plans taking place. Because that really means we're getting out of the way, trusting him and letting his son do it through us. And it's like with our children, when we see them excel and mm -hmm. grow and mature physically, mentally, and we're, we're proud and we're happy. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. God seeing us like it. Yeah. Oh, my kids. Yeah, yeah. I'm working in them <clears throat> and through them and he sees what is what we are becoming in him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in one, in one of our previous Bible studies, God basically does that about Job. You see oh. him bragging about him. Right. I mean, yeah. right. I would love to have God be able to brag oh, about me, but I'm not sure I want the 40 chapters oh, after right. that. Uh, you know, <laughs> so uh, we'll just let him take care of what he's got to do Thank because he yes. knows what I can handle and what I can't. Yes. Uh, God's already doing it. Yeah, well, <laughs> not quite the same as Job. So no, the, yeah. we, we often look at God's Word, all these stories and narratives and stuff, and yes, we're really encouraged by them, this and that. But God says, I'm, already, I'm doing the same thing in your life. Mm -hmm. I'm not just not written down there, yeah. but I'm doing it. Yeah. And yeah. If you're waiting for the big day where now he's going to start to do that, to do it. Well, so it's, all, it yeah. it's already <laughs> happening. It's already happening. Yeah, that's yeah. for and sure. That's why we should <coughs> rejoice in our circumstances yeah. because God mm -hmm. has our circumstances exactly where He, he has ordained them yes. all along. Yes. Because yeah. He knows exactly what we need. Yes. He knows exactly, and He loves us and cares for us just like He loved Job and, and Daniel and, and all these people. And it's not as if we are inferior <laughs> as a person but but no but maybe inferior in our amount of faith and stuff like yeah, that yeah, but yeah. Uh, god says i'm writing your story and i wake up to that because <laughs> it's not going to be a different book <laughs> it's your book yeah. like, <laughs> and we desperately 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 need to be in the word of god it's already been alluded to a couple of times but and just recently i watched yeah, a video teaching teaching from a godly person uh, who by and large I would respect but um, it was he, it came across in a way that basically all um, basically justified divorce and I'm like I, I, I just wasn't down with it, you know, it's like, so all I, all I know about that is God hates divorce. Yeah. yeah, he says it, that settles it, you know. No, it's not the unpardonable sin. It's not the, it's not, it's but not it the, but, oh yeah, 
it destroys I like it so much. When we throw a stone in the water and the ripples, and yeah. that's what it does in the families. Yeah. It, it, it's you, it's your husband, it's the children, it's the grandchildren, it's the parents, it's the aunts. It's just friends. It just Friends, fam- relatives. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Keep going. It yeah. affects everyone. Yeah, yeah. And all these people witness the demise of the situation. Yeah, yes. Yep. And, and, yes. But really, and if you never look down on anybody who's experienced that, that is, you know, but anyways, so, but especially if we are in a place where we still can choose to say, okay, I, my mind says divorce is the answer, but God, He is, He does things so differently. And he says, I can restore, or I can make this situation glorify me. But don't try to fix it yourself. Right. Because he can put it back together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's nothing nothing beyond him. So my next note to finish off this uh, verse 4, God's ways are always different than ours. Mm -hmm. God endorses a gentle and quiet spirit. The world endorses... Don't put up with it. Mm-hmm. Don't take that guff from anyone, especially a man. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you can't get further apart than God's ways versus the counsel right. of the world. You know, and I mean, that's 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 what you hear. That's why that's why that's why the world. One of the reasons the world's the way it is. And then um, I think last commentator. <clears throat> meek, not creating disturbances, quiet, bearing with tranquility the disturbances caused by others. Say that again, please. Meek, this is from a commentator, meek, not creating disturbances, quiet, bearing with tranquility the disturbances caused by others. Yeah. That's, That's good. I like that it's one. It's kind of like, okay. If there's a disturbance going on, if maybe before it's before you recognize it's a disturbance, but you, as soon as you recognize it's a disturbance, then just yeah, just be quiet yeah. because yeah. The, they're not going to recognize that that they're creating a disturbance. Let alone if you would tell them they are, they're not going to be able to receive that. So just be quiet. A quiet answer to play loud for starter. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and just, um, you got you got to recognize, by the way, that is a spiritual moment. Mm-hmm. It might just be an argument on trifle things, but it's, it, you know, there, there's, it's not a moment where there's going to be healing the way you would just, just put in your opinion. Right, right, right. Solve it. No, no, just, just quiet. And let God take it from there. Yeah. Yep, and we back again as we <coughs> wrap up this week. We did three verses this week. Um, so, uh, but uh, back again, repeated through Peter uh, over and over. Bottom line is trust God. You know, the only one whose relationship you can work on with God is your own, yeah. you know. And so... All right, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week. God bless.